This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Twilight Imperium, the third edition. Twilight Imperium, the third edition, is a game of galactic conquest for three to six players released by Fantasy Flight Games in 2005. The game was designed by Christian T. Peterson and takes about three to five hours to play. This is the third and final part of our Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition game tutorial. If you have not seen episode 1 and 2 of this series, I highly recommend you go back and watch those. Episode 1 covered the lore and the game setup, and episode 2 went into great depths on the strategy cards. In this episode, we're going to jump right into the thick of things. So let's pick up where we left off last time. Now, before we get too deep in the game rules, let's familiarize ourselves with the military hardware at our disposal. Now, to help you remember the game stats, I've created a custom iconography. Units can be divided into two groups. Fleet units that can only operate in space regions and planetary units that can only operate on the planet's surface. Let's use this cruiser as an example. First, let's look at the stats on the left side of the unit card. The first stat is Battle. This is the attack roll to meet or beat on a d10 to score a hit. Below this is armor. Armor is the number of hits needed to destroy the unit. Most units can only suffer one hit, but there are a few units that can suffer multiple hits. Below armor is cost. Cost refers to the number of planetary resources or trade goods necessary to purchase the unit. Now, starting on the top of the right side of the unit card. First is move. Move is the number of system hexes a unit can move into. Below this is capacity. Capacity is the number of cargo and docking points on a unit. These points can typically be used to store PDS units, fighters, and ground forces units. The final stat is limit. Limit is the total number of units of this type that are allowed in the game. In Twilight Imperium, once you run out of units, you cannot produce any more. The only units without limits are ground forces and fighters. Now let's take a look at the game's units. Carriers are the workhorses of the galaxy. Each carrier is equipped with six cargo units. A cargo unit can be loaded with a fighter, a ground forces unit, or a planetary defense unit. Carriers can only unload ground forces and planetary defense systems during the planetary landings phase. However, carriers can pick up units from any system in which it started its movement. The only exceptions being if the system is enemy occupied or if it has been previously activated by another player. Be warned, if a carrier is destroyed, they lose all PDS and ground force units. Fighters may survive an attack if they have a place to dock once the battle is over. The carrier can further be augmented with tech upgrades. These upgrades can increase the combat ability, allow a carrier to navigate through asteroid fields, and navigate past enemy ships, as well as add plus one to movement. Next to the War Sun, Dreadnoughts are the most feared warships in the galaxy. Dreadnoughts have incredibly strong hull plating that takes two hits to destroy them. If a Dreadnought suffers one hit, you flip it upside down to represent it's damaged. At the end of the game round, Dreadnoughts can be repaired to full strength again. One of the Dreadnoughts' unique weapons is the ability to conduct planetary bombardment. Planetary bombardment is conducted immediately before invasion combat and landing of planetary forces. The Dreadnought's owner rolls a d10 and on a roll of 5 or above scores a hit on a planetary unit. The player who owns the planetary units chooses which unit to remove as a casualty. 
However, if a PDS unit is present on the planet, their shields nullify this ability. Dreadnoughts also have the most tech upgrades in the game. Although already a formidable opponent, tech upgrades make them even more dangerous. Combat, movement, and capacity stats can all be upgraded. Besides planetary bombardment, the Dreadnought's weapons can be further enhanced. The Assault Cannon can provide a pre-battle shot, and the X-89 Bacterial Weapon can be used to wipe out every living thing on a planet. The Cruiser is the economic choice for conquest-minded races. It's cheap and has decent battle stats. The Cruiser's battle, movement, and capacity can be further enhanced with tech upgrades. Destroyers are fast, inexpensive, and versatile ships. Destroyers have the ability to engage fighters prior to battle and conduct anti-fighter barrages. During the pre-battle sequence, a destroyer may roll 2d10s. For each 9 or above rolled, a fighter is destroyed and is not allowed to return fire. With tech upgrades, the destroyer's combat rolls and movement can further be enhanced. Without a doubt, the kings of space are the War Suns. War Suns hit on a 3 or above, and they get to take 3 shots per attack. War Suns also have a planetary bombardment ability that is so strong it cannot be blocked by PDS shields. Due to their thick armor, it takes 2 hits to destroy a War Sun. War Sun also have 6 cargo bays. Each cargo bay can hold one fighter or a ground forces unit or a planetary defense system. A player must gain the War Sun production technology to be able to create War Suns. They also have several other upgrades that allow them to increase their movement as well as deploy bacterial weapons that can destroy any living thing on a planet. When a War Sun receives one hit, it is considered damaged and it's flipped over. A damaged War Sun can be repaired at the end of the game round. Fighters cannot move by themselves and must be transported. They also cannot conduct planetary invasions until they've been properly upgraded. There is no limit to the number of fighters you can purchase. And fighters do not count against fleet limits. Therefore, fighters must always have a docking space aboard one of your ships. Fighters can dock aboard transports, war suns, and space docks. With the appropriate upgrade, fighters can also dock with cruisers and dreadnoughts. Space docks are essentially planetary industrial complexes. There is a limit of one space dock per planet, there is a limit of one space dock per planet, and the player must have controlled the planet for the entire round to build one. To build a new space dock, the system must be activated and not contain any enemy ships. Newly constructed space docks cannot produce units until the following round. For a space dock to produce units, the system that they occupy must be activated. During the last step of the tactical or transfer action, you can produce new units with your space dock. However, space docks can only produce the number of units equal to the planet's resources plus two. And if the system is blockaded, they can only produce units on the planet they occupy. Space docks are also equipped with three docking bays for fighters and their production abilities can be further enhanced with tech upgrades. Ground force units are an essential part of your military. At least one ground forces unit is required to take control of planets. Ground forces units must be transported throughout the galaxy. Both carriers and war suns can transport six ground forces units. There is no limit on the number of ground forces units that can be produced. If you run out of figures, you can use tokens as a replacement. Ground Force's combat and recovery skills can further be enhanced with tech upgrades. Planetary Defense Systems, or PDSs, are essential to preventing invasions. 
PDS units are equipped with a space cannon that allow them to shoot anywhere in the system against enemy ships. A player gets one shot per PDS and rolls a 10-sided dice. On a roll of six or more, a ship is destroyed. With a PDS space cannon attack, no return fire is permitted. PDS units can also create a planetary shield that protects planetary forces against dreadnought bombardment. PDS units can also be transported in war suns, carriers, and if upgraded, cruisers and dreadnoughts. In Twilight Imperium, combat is resolved with the roll of a 10-sided dice. A roll at or above the attack value is considered a hit. Rolls beneath this number are considered a miss. Each unit gets to roll one dice per attack, except for the War Sun, which gets to roll three dice per attack. Now that we've learned about the units and seen how the attack rolls work, let's look at the different stages of combat. And where we left off is in the middle of the action phase. It's been a while, but now we're back to our action phase screen. To get ourselves regrounded again in the action phase, let's do a little recap. So as you can see, we brought out our old friend again, the Stegosaurus. Oh no, it's an old Ben Hosh mind trick. You betcha. We played through the strategy phase and divvied up the strategy card amongst the six players. We then dove into the guts of the beast with the action phase. In the action phase, we covered off on each of the strategy cards that can come into play. The numbers on these cards establish the order of play. We then covered off on the events that transpire with each card, from diplomacy, to trade, to technology. We're going to finish up the order of play with everyone's favorite discussion, Planetary Conquest. Then we're going to transition to the status phase where we clean up the game and prepare for the next round and learn how objectives are translated into victory points. All right, you've been good, you've ate your vegetables, now it's time for dessert. Let's finally talk about conquest. Military action is handled in the tactical action, so let's take a look. The tactical action is divided into seven steps. The first step is to activate a system. The Mentak player has decided to invade the Hakan home system. The Mentak player looks at their race sheet, selects a command counter from their command pool, and places it on the Hakan home system. This home system is now considered activated. The next step in the sequence is to move ships. Next, the Mentak player may move any ships within range to that command counter. The Mentak player then checks the fleet supply on their race sheet. They have four command counters in fleet supply. This means that the maximum size of a Mentak fleet is four ships per system. The Mentak player has four ships within range of the Hakan home system and moves them there. Once the ships have moved, the Mentak invasion fleet is composed of a cruiser, a dreadnought, a destroyer, and a transport. And aboard that transport are six ground force units. Now let's zoom in our view to get a closer look at the Hakan home system. Systems are divided into two distinct regions. The region of a system space can only be occupied by starships. Planetary regions can only be occupied by planetary units. The regions of each planet is also its own territory. So for our example here, the Hakan home system is actually four different territories. The Hakan system space region and the planetary regions, Aretz, Cam Dorn, and Herkant. 
Therefore, to fully conquer the Hakan home system, all four of these territories must be captured and held. If either side does not hold all territories, then the system is considered blockaded. Therefore, the first battle takes place in the Hakan system's space region. Let's focus in further on the Hakan home system's space region. The Mentec fleet has just crossed the border into this region of space. The next step of the tactical action is PDS fire. There is a PDS unit on the planet of Camdorn. The Hakan player fires the PDS's space cannon at the Mentak fleet. The Hakan player rolls a D10 for a space cannon shot and must get a 6 or above to score a hit. The Hakan player rolls the dice and rolls a 6 to score a hit. The Mentak player gets to select the casualty and chooses his cruiser. And with that, the PDS fire sequence is complete and we move to the space battle. The Hakan defense fleet engages the Mentak invaders. A lone transport launches six fighters. Now let's pause and learn about how a round of combat works. When the battle first begins, players will need to resolve any before battle actions. Examples of before battle actions include destroyers attacking fighters and dreadnought strikes. Once you've resolved before battle actions, then you can proceed to the normal combat round. The combat round begins with phase 1, declare retreat. Now, you may or may not want to declare retreat during the first combat round, but be aware if you declare retreat, you cannot immediately leave the battle. You cannot actually retreat until later in the combat round. So let's continue. Phase 2 is conducting the actual combat. In this phase, each player is going to roll 1d10 for each of his units and 3d10 for any war sons engaged in the conflict. The hits are totaled up and we proceed to phase 3, remove casualties. In this phase, each player chooses which of his own units he wants to inflict with casualties. These casualty units are then removed from the battle. In phase 4, if you declared retreat in phase 1, now you can withdraw your units from the battle. If you did not declare your retreat in Phase 1, then you proceed onward to Phase 1 again and repeat the cycle. You will continue this cycle until either one side has lost all their units, or a player has declared retreat and withdrawn their units in Phase 4. Now, let's resume our space battle. The first combat round begins with Before Battle Actions. The Mentak fleet has a destroyer so they can perform a before battle action versus the enemy fighters. To conduct this action, the Mentak player rolls two 10 sided dice for the destroyer. The Mentak player rolls the dice and rolls a 9 and a 0, two hits. Now that the pre-battle actions are complete, we proceed to step 1, declare retreat. Neither side declares retreat, so we proceed to step 2 and conduct combat. Next, each side is going to roll one 10-sided dice for each unit they have in the battle. First, the Mentak player rolls for his Dreadnought. He rolls a 5, which is a hit. Next, he rolls for the Carrier and rolls a 10, which is another hit. Finally, he rolls for his destroyer, and rolls a 0, which is another hit. 
The Hakan defenders also roll a 10-sided dice for each unit. He rolls for the first fighter and rolls a 9, which is a hit. Second fighter rolls a 3, which is a miss. Third fighter rolls an 8, which is also a miss. The carrier rolls a 10, which is a hit. And the last fighter rolls a 5, which is a miss. Now, each side is going to take the damage they suffered and apply it to the ships of their choice. The Mentak player decides to take one damage and apply it to his destroyer, which is eliminated. He then decides to take his second damage and apply it to his dreadnought, which is then damaged. The dreadnought is flipped upside down to represent it's damaged. The Hakan player applies all damage to the fighters, eliminating three. Since no retreat is declared, we skip step four and move back to step one. Now, either player has a chance to declare retreat. Neither player declares retreat, so we go through the cycle again. So now let's repeat conduct combat and roll for each unit. The Dreadnought rolls and rolls a 7, which is a hit. The Carrier rolls. Then the Hakan player rolls. The Hakan player rolls for his carrier and rolls a 0, which is a hit. The Hakan player rolls for his fighter and rolls a 2, which is a miss. Now, regardless of the order, both of the Hakan's defender ships are destroyed. The Mintak player, however, has a choice, and he chooses to sacrifice the Dreadnought. This will allow him to proceed with the invasion with his carrier and ground units. So now let's move to that stage of battle. Invasion combat also has its own combat round. The first step of invasion combat is to conduct the before battle actions. If the invading forces have a Dreadnought or War Sun, they can conduct Planetary Bombardment. Just remember, if a Dreadnought is performing Planetary Bombardment and there's a PDS on the planet, it nullifies that ability. The first step of a formal combat round is PDS Fire. The defending player may fire a shot with each of his PDS units on the planet. For every hit, a Ground Forces unit is removed and is not allowed to return fire. The next step is to conduct combat. In the next step, each side rolls a 10-sided dice for each of its units. The next step is to remove casualties. The combat rolls are calculated to see if there's a hit, and then casualties are removed. Combat advances to the next round, and you start the cycle over again with PDS fire. The next step in the tactical action is planetary landing. Now the Mentak player must decide which planet he's going to land on. The Mentak player selects the planet of Herkant. And we proceed to the next phase, invasion combat. The Hakan have two ground force units defending the planet. The Mentak invasion force is six ground force units. Similar to space combat, each side rolls a 10-sided dice for each unit. The Mintak player rolls for the first ground force unit, and rolls a 2, which is a miss. Second unit rolls a 5, which is also a miss. Third unit rolls a 9, which is a hit. Fourth unit rolls an 8, which is a miss. Fifth unit rolls a 9, which is a hit. And sixth unit rolls a 3, which is a miss. Now on the Hakan side, the Hakan player rolls for the first unit and rolls an 8, which is a miss. Rolls for the second unit and rolls a 6, which also is a miss. Next, each side subtracts their losses. The losses eliminate the Hakan defenders, and the Mentak are victorious. The Mentak player will assume control of the planet card for Hakant. 
Please note though, whenever a player takes control of a planet and receives the planet card, the planet card is exhausted. The next step in the sequence is to produce units. Producing units is not apt in this example, so we're going to save it for when we talk about the transfer action, which is next. And we're back to the action phase screen. Now that we've covered off on the tactical action, let me show you what the difference is with a transfer action. The primary purpose of a transfer action is to reorganize your units between two systems. In the first step of a transfer action, the player will activate two adjacent systems. Both systems must contain at least one unit controlled by the active player, and neither system can contain enemy units. Finally, you can never activate a system that has already been activated by another player during the round. You'll be able to tell this because that system will contain a command counter from another player. This action will require you to pay one command counter from your command pool and take one command counter from the reinforcement area. Essentially, you're only charged one command counter for conducting this action. In the next step, you're going to move ships. In the next step, if there are any PDS units that are within range, they can open fire at the player. This is mainly for PDS units that have been upgraded with extended range. Next, the planetary landing takes place. Finally, the player may produce units. And finally, if there's a star dock in either system, you can produce units. Now, let's see how unit production works. Unit production can fall into two processes, creating new space docks and using existing space docks to produce new units. There is a limit of one space dock per planet. To produce a space dock on a new planet, the player must have controlled that planet for the entire round. The system where you want to build the space dock must not contain any enemy ships and you must activate the system containing the planet for construction. If you meet all these criteria, then you can produce a new space dock, but you can't use it until the following round. When your space dock is ready to produce new units, then you follow the next process. Activate the system containing your space dock. In the last step of either the tactical or transfer action, you will be allowed to produce units. Space docks can only produce the number of units equal to the planet's resources plus two. Also be sure you have the required number of resources to be able to build the units. You can exhaust planets for resources or use trade goods. If enemy units inhabit the system where your space dock resides, then you can only produce planetary units in this blockaded system. And that is how unit production works in Twilight Imperium. We are nearing the end of the game round. Let's talk about the status phase. Now at long last, we find ourselves at the status phase. Much like the strategy phase, this phase is fairly quick. The main goals of the status phase are to prepare the game for the next round of play and see if how many players qualify for objectives. There are seven steps in the status phase. Step one, first see which players qualify for objectives. Step two, repair damaged ships. Step three, remove all command counters from the galaxy map and return them to the reinforcement area. Step four, each player refreshes all their planet cards. Step 5. Each player receives two command counters from their reinforcement area and draws one action card. Step 6. Players can redistribute the command counters on their race sheet. Be aware, if you reduce your fleet command counter number below the number of ships in any fleet you have on the galaxy map, those extra ships are destroyed. And finally, in step 7, you're going to refresh the strategy cards you used during the last round. 
Now, let's discuss some official game variants that you can use to add even more depth to the Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition experience. First, let's take a look at Distant Suns. The Distant Suns variant simulates the dangers and rewards of space exploration and colonization. To play the Distant Suns variant, perform the following during the Galaxy Map setup. First, place all Distant Sun tokens face down and randomize them. Next, place a face down Distant Sun token on every neutral planet on the galaxy map. Now, every time you land on a neutral planet, you'll flip over the token to see what the result is. So let's take a look at the token definitions in the core game. If a biohazard token is revealed, then the first ground force unit is killed and you remove the counter. If the radiation token is revealed, all ground force units are eliminated, then remove the counter. A token with a number and a target reticle means there are hostile locals. Players must face off against that number of ground force units and conquer the planet. If you find a wormhole symbol, place it in the center of the system. This discovered wormhole can be used to travel to other wormholes of the same type. You may also discover on some planets, Lazak survivors. When discovering members of this long-lost race, you receive three additional votes towards the next political agenda. If a flag symbol is drawn, then there are already settlers on the planet. When this occurs, return all planetary forces and roll a dice. On a roll of 1 through 5, Place two ground force units from another player's reinforcement. That player already has settlers on the planet. If you want that planet, you're going to need to invade. If you roll a six or above, there are already settlers of your own race on the planet, so add two free ground forces from reinforcements. Once either outcome is resolved, remove the counter. Discovery of the gears icon equals an industrial society. Place a free space duck on the planet, and when you receive the planet card, it is not exhausted. A counter with an atomic symbol is a technological society. When this happens, the player to your left draws a technology card from your deck and gives it to you. The token with a planet symbol is peaceful annexation. When this token is revealed, landing proceeds without incident, and just discard the counter. If you do not have the required prerequisites for this technology, keep drawing cards until you find one that you do. Finally, if you draw this counter, the planet has natural wealth, and you can collect the trade goods indicated from the number and remove the token. There are also these different options for exploring planets. If players do not want to risk a landing force on the planet's surface, they can dispatch a fighter to probe the planet. Fighters can be sent on probing missions after the movement step of the tactical action, but not the transfer action. When the fighter probes, you may look at every domain counter in that system. When you've completed your probe, you place the domain counters face down again, except if there are Lazak survivors. If the planet contains Lazak survivors, then your probing rewards you with one victory point and you get to draw three action cards. For whatever reason, if you decide you don't want to deal with the domain counter, you can choose to raise the planet. For each Dreadnought or War Sun you have in the targeted system, you can raise one planet. Raising a planet is considered a controversial act by the Galactic Council. Therefore, whenever you raise a planet, you need to roll a 10-sided dice. On a roll of 1 through 7, there's no effect. The Galactic Council's attention is pointed elsewhere. On a roll of 8 or 9, the player is penalized and loses 3 action cards. On a roll of 8 or 9, the player is punished by losing 3 random action cards. On a roll of 10, the player is punished by losing 3 random action cards and all their planets are exhausted. And that's how you add the Distant Suns variant to your game. Now let's take a look at how leaders can be integrated into the game. 
In the leader's gameplay variant, each race gets three leader tokens. During the setup phase, once players have finished creating the galaxy, then leaders can be placed on each player's home system. Leaders can be transported by any ship to get around the galaxy, and their presence does not count towards that ship's capacity. Leaders can also be transferred to a planet's surface. However, if it's a neutral or enemy planet, a leader must be accompanied by at least one ground force unit. Now, let's take a closer look at each leader type and learn their abilities. Leaders are divided into five groups and identified by these emblems. Agents, Generals, Diplomats, Scientists, and Admirals. Leaders' abilities are divided into two groups. Planet Bonus Abilities and Fleet Bonus Abilities. When a leader is amongst the fleet, you must identify which ship the leader is on. Likewise, you must always communicate which planet a leader is on in a system. For an agent, the planet bonuses are as follows. As an attacking invader, enemy PDS units may not attack your ground forces. And after a successful invasion, any enemy PDS and space docks are captured instead of destroyed. Agents can also be sacrificed as a sabotage maneuver to cancel enemy action cards. The general has the following planet bonuses. When attacking as an invader, you can reroll two of your dice. Invading Dreadnoughts and War Sons receive negative four to their bombardment rolls. And, defending from invasion, ground forces receive plus one to combat rolls. For the Diplomats' planet bonuses, they may delay planetary invasion by one round. However, you can only use this every other round on the same planet. For the Diplomats' fleet bonuses, the fleet can move through an opponent's system with permission from the owner. For the scientists' planet bonuses, they get a technology discount of 2 versus 1. Scientists also grant plus 1 to PDS combat rolls. And they may build space docks for 2 resources rather than 4. Also, if a scientist is on a planet with a PDS, they can prevent a War Sun's planetary bombardment ability. For the Admiral's fleet bonuses, they get plus one to Dreadnought movement. And they get to roll one additional attack dice for ships carrying the Admiral. An Admiral in a fleet battle also prevents the enemy fleet from retreating. Unless the enemy fleet also has an Admiral. Now, while leaders can provide some great benefits to gameplay, there are also some dangers to be aware of. In a planetary invasion, if leaders are present when their army is defeated, then a 10-sided dice is rolled. On a roll of 1 through 5, the leader is captured. On a roll of 6 through 9, the leader escapes and is moved to a friendly planet. On a roll of 10, the leader is killed. In a similar fashion, if a leader is aboard a ship when it's destroyed, the player also rolls a 10-sided dice. If a 1 through 5 is rolled, the leader is killed. If a 6 through 8 is rolled, the leader escapes. If a 9 or a 10 is rolled, the leader is captured. Leaders that are captured are placed on that player's race sheet. During the status phase, leaders can be ransomed, sold to other players, or even traded for favors. There is also the possibility of a leader rescue. If a player takes control of a planet whose prior owner holds a leader, then a 10-sided dice is rolled. On a roll of 1 through 8, no prisoners are found on the planet. On a roll of 9 or 10, however, a leader is found. Only one leader can be found per planet, unless that planet happens to be that race's last planet. Keep these rules in mind if you're interested in adding leaders to your next game.
Now, we've covered off on all aspects of the Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition game. That wraps up this episode of Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.